Welcome to section 10.2, where we're going to start moving away from just the cell cycle and how cells reproduce, and we're going to focus upon how organisms that sexually reproduce, reproduce and pass on their genetic information. So it's not just about do we get cells that are produced by parents, do we get things that are identical or different, it's about how do we track how traits are passed from parents to offspring, so how is it that offspring can look like their parents, or in some cases not look like their parents. So the first guy to really dig into this, the first guy to kind of disprove the prevailing ideas called the blending hypothesis, where people just figured, oh, if there's one person's tall and one's short, your kid should be somewhere in between. If your kid happens to be taller than you, apparently you weren't the person involved in that particular mating event. Uh, so Mendel was a monk, and he was trained in two very useful fields, botany, so basically growing plants, and statistics. So he was a mathematical guy that loved to look at probabilities, to look at whether or not something was likely to be caused by something else. He was good at looking for patterns. So these were wonderful traits for one person looking at heredity to half. And so he went through and started breeding pea plants at the monastery because this was a good choice. They grew fast. They produced food, so it wasn't like he was doing something that was a jerk move for a monk who's supposed to be living kind of pious and without a whole lot of money. Uh, it also is useful because there's a lot of traits that peas possess that only have two possibilities, like tall or short, purple flowers or white flowers. So he was able to look at seven of these traits that only had two possibilities, which gave him a great way of getting data. If he would have tried to study humans, where in humans we have lots of traits that are very, very complicated genetically, he probably wouldn't have been able to get any useful data and discover anything. But by picking kind of a simpler plant, he was able to do a lot with it. So let's start off and discuss some of the terms that he used that we will use. So first of all, when you start reproducing things, you've got your parental generation, the pea generation. So these were the initial plants that he had been breeding for a while. And what he would do is he would self-pollinate them, breed them with themselves, and make sure that he got all offspring that were identical to the parent for that trait. So in other words, he self-pollinated a plant with white flowers and made sure he got all offspring plants with white flowers from that particular mating. If this occurred, he called them true breeding or pure breeding. At the time, he didn't know, you know why that was, he just knew it happened. So for a lot of these traits he studied, he would get true or pure breeding plants for each version of the trait. So in this case, we've got white flowers or purple flowers. He then would go, well, what happens if I cross two different pure breeding plants? So if I cross a white flower and a purple flower, what am I gonna get? So he did that and got his F1 generation. So the F1 generation, the first filial, it's the first set of offspring. So this is essentially the children. And what he found in most cases was that all of them looked like one of the parents. In this case, you'll see they all had purple flowers. So this was kind of surprised that he didn't get a mix of purple and white, or he didn't get one that was kind of like a, a lighter shade of purple because it was a blended white and purple. They were all purple. They all looked just like the purple parent. He then took some of these F1 guys. I don't know why, but it was brilliant. He took some of the F1s and bred them with one another. So he crossed two F1 plants and got an F2 plant. So F2 will be any time there's a mating and you get grandchildren, essentially, the second set of offspring. Those are F2 plants. And so he went through this far. Now, technically, he could have taken F2 plants and crossed them to get F3s just from a terminology standpoint, but the farthest that we're going to go with him is to F2s. He then said, all right, I'm going to call each of these general characteristics that I'm looking at, like flower color, I'm going to call them a characteristic. We now call that a gene, though. So I'm going to give you both terms to make sure you realize that they're interchangeable, although nowadays we prefer gene. At the time, Mendel didn't know about genetics because he kind of discovered it. Uh, so he just used the term characteristic was the general one. So like height, flower color, pea color. It's not saying which specific version you have. It's just saying what is the character I'm looking at. So for humans, this would be like hair color. I'm not saying whether it's brown or blonde or black or red. I'm just saying I'm looking at the characteristic of hair color. So that's what we typically call a gene now. And then for each gene, there appeared to be different possibilities. 
So he called those traits or forms, and we call those alleles. So when we talk about hair color, for instance, in humans, you could say that the alleles could be red or blonde or brown or black, even though it's not actually that simple for human hair color. We're just going to use that as an analogy for now because it helps it make sense in your brain. So in height, if that's our gene, the alleles could be tall or short. If it was flower color, the alleles would be white or purple. Now he also had this idea of dominance versus recessive. The reason this mattered is he knew sometimes he would kind of pair up and he'd kind of have this battle between the two different alleles. So the purple flowers and the white flowers would be our example. And so he knew when this kind of battle occurred that one of them always won out in the F1. Every F1 plant looked like one of the parents. So he said whichever one, whichever allele seems to win out whenever they kind of face each other, that one was dominant. And the one that disappears, although this is the key thing, it's not officially gone. Because he noticed in the F2s, he got three of the offspring for every four would look like the dominant trait, but there was still one of them that looked like the recessive parent. So this recessive trait was one that seems to be able to hide, but it's not gone. This happened for every trait. So when he did tall and short, he saw all the F1s were tall. But then when he looked at the F2s, he had three talls for every one short. So 25% of the F2s were short. And so he defined that one as being the recessive, the one that disappears in the F1 and the one that's only present 25% in the F2s. This was critical because it showed him that whatever it was that seemed to disappear in the F1 wasn't officially gone. It was just masked, it was just hiding, but it was still able to show up in later generations. So it was okay if two purple flowers had a flower that was white flowered, had an offspring that was white flowered. That didn't mean that somehow there was impropriety in the part of these flowers involved. So looking at the traits just real quick to make sure you're comfortable, I've lined up all the dominant traits on the left side. So these are the ones that would be present in the F1 generation entirely. And I've lined up the recessive traits on the right hand side. So these would be the ones that were present as the three to one ratio at the end of the F2. So dominant, recessive, and so these guys for F2s, we'll just put that down there, these would be the threes, and I'm going to do the little colon to show it's a ratio, and these would be the ones. So in terms of the peas themselves, we have round peas is dominant to wrinkled, and we have yellow peas is dominant to green. These are the peas here we're talking about, the actual seeds. We then have the pods that we can discuss, that's what we're looking at for the second group of two. The pods are dominantly green, and so we're looking at this structure here that's holding the peas. Uh, and then ultimately they are dominantly smooth, which means they look kind of like this one. You'll see there is a constricted version where they seem to kind of wrap around the peas. So you'll see the actual casing, this pod casing, still has these bumps and ridges. They call that constricted. So that's recessive for pods. For flowers, we have purple and white. Purple is dominant. We've already discussed this one. You can see the purple flower there. Uh, and then we have the location of the flowers. So we have axials where it's kind of further in on the stem, if you will, whereas terminal would be at the tips. And you tend to see them axial. So you tend to see them where they're, if you're growing the thing, you can see a flower like here versus terminal, which means it have to be on the end, terminal, axial. And then lastly, we have height of the plants. And so height, you're going to see tall is dominant, short is not. We'll put flowers here. And just in case you need it for the top, remember this is for the seeds. All right, so those are just a quick rundown of the characteristics he looked at and ultimately which was which.